In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. I love you, O Lord, my strength. O Lord, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock of refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Praise be the Lord, I exclaim, and I am safe from my enemies. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock. Extolled be God, my Savior. You who gave great victories to your king and showed kindness to your anointed. I love you, Lord, my strength. Lord Jesus, as we begin this time of prayer in your presence, help us have a full confidence in you, in your power, in your goodness, in your providence. I love you, Lord, my strength. And we can use these opening moments of prayer to pray for peace, to pray for peace especially in Israel and in Ukraine, where wars continue to rage, to pray for peace also in our own communities, at times torn by violence or threatened by violence, to pray for peace in our families and in our hearts. Lord Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. We send up an urgent appeal in this world right now, so torn by tension and conflict, suffering. Grant us your peace. Be peace for us. Christ is our peace, as St. Paul puts it. You, Jesus, are our peace. Bring peace to this world of yours and of ours. I love you, O Lord, my strength. O Lord, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock of refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. These are words from today's responsorial psalm, Psalm 18. And it's so good for us to remind ourselves and to pray with these truths what God is for us, all that God is for us and wants to be for us and can be for us. If we believe, if we make acts of faith, if we continue to trust in him, our strength, our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, a rock of refuge, a shield, the horn of our salvation, our stronghold. God is more our goodness and more our safety and more our security than anything else could ever be, than we could ever be for ourselves. And especially our goodness, that's such an incredible thought that God is our goodness, God is our righteousness. We can't make ourselves good. We can't merit enough to save ourselves or to go to heaven. We have to rely on God for our own goodness. This is from Jeremiah. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. It's the name of you, Jesus. It's a name for our Savior in the prophecy of Jeremiah. The Lord is our righteousness. Jesus himself is our goodness. We've outsourced our sanctity. We've outsourced our salvation to you, to our Lord, Jesus Christ. And of course, for Jesus to be our righteousness, we have to do our part. We have to believe in him. We have to be sorry for our sins. We have to be humble enough and brave enough to recognize our sinfulness and confess them and be sorry for them. We have to have a good, earnest effort and decision to turn away from sin and to live in Christ, to live like Christ. But at the same time, we're aware of our weakness and we're aware of our smallness 
and we're aware of this incredible fact that Jesus is our goodness. God does the heavy lifting of our sanctification, of our sanctity. We outsource it to him, like a company that doesn't want to do its own accounting or run its own payroll or have its own security. Well, it outsources it, right? It goes and it looks for an accounting firm or a payroll service or a security company to provide those services. Well, in our faith and in our humility, we do this with our goodness. Lord, I'm not good enough. You have to be good for me. You have to be good in me. You have to be good with me. I can't do this alone. I need to lean on you for all of this. And all of this especially takes faith. Jesus, if you're going to truly be my rock, my refuge, my stronghold, if I'm going to be firm and brave in the face of evil and in the face of challenge in my life, well, I I have to have faith in you. I have to really believe that you are all this for me. Without faith, this doesn't go anywhere. Without true conviction and faith, we're running on fumes. The prophet Isaiah said this to King Ahaz, If you do not stand firm in faith, you shall not stand at all. Unless you believe, unless you stand firm in faith, you won't be firm. Unless your faith is strong, you won't be strong. And so God being a rock and a refuge and a stronghold and a fortress, all those wonderful images of what God is for us and what God wants to be for us and what God can be for us, was all unlocked for us by faith, by conviction, that God is that, that he is all-powerful, that he, he is our Redeemer, that he is indeed our salvation. Unless you believe, you will not stand firm. If you do not stand firm in faith, you shall not stand at all. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Another one of these statements. Right? It's like fill in the blank. The Lord is my blank. And here we have the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God is our salvation. He's our Savior and our salvation. And salvation, as we know, is healing. It's what heals us of our maladies. It's what heals us of our wounds. It's what heals us, especially, of our sins. God himself is our salvation. And that's closely connected, of course, Jesus, to your being our righteousness, to our taking on your merits in baptism and in the other sacraments. That salvation and holiness are two sides of the same coin. We're healed in order to be holy. We're healed in order to be good. We're made healthy so that we can function well, so that we can thrive as children of God as true Christians, as other Christs. And we find our righteousness and therefore also our healing, our salvation in God, in God, and not in our own efforts or in ourselves. About 20 years ago or so, UPS had this motto, this kind of advertising slogan, which was, what can Brown do for you? And so UPS, all of their delivery trucks are brown and the uniforms are brown. And so they had these commercials kind of detailing all of the different services that UPS and its UPS centers provide. And the question to people and business owners especially was, what can Brown do for you? 
How can we help you? Look at all the ways that we can help you. And this is a good question for our faith, right? What can God do for me? What can God be for me? Who is God for me? And Scripture keeps inviting us to answer that question in these incredibly awesome and helpful and encouraging ways. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my righteousness. God himself is all these things for me. But we need faith to unlock that. And so we ask Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. Be all these things for me. That's a good way to pray, right? Lord, be my rock. Help me not to look for security or firmness in myself or merely in my talents or in the world. Lord, be my righteousness. Help me to be humble enough to realize that I'm not good enough on my own. My own level of charity, my own level of virtue doesn't cut it, doesn't pass muster. And so, Lord, I need you to be my righteousness. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. We read in Psalm 35, wonderful lines, one of my favorite lines of scripture. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Tell us, Lord, that you save us. Truly be a savior for us. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. It's like couples at times where they need to hear it, right? They need to hear their spouse tell them that they love them. This is an important thing. I love you. To tell our loved ones that we love them. It's good to hear and it's good to say. And the psalmist is saying this to God. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Say to my soul that you love me and save me. What can God be for us? What can God do for us? Lord, we want you to be all of this. We need you to be all of this for us. And be our God. Help us not to have false gods before you. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge, we read in Psalm 16. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Another incredible line from the Psalms, so important and so beautifully said and so deep. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. We tell God to tell us that he is our salvation. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. And then we take our part and we tell our Lord that he is our Lord. He is our God. You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Psalm 16 continues, As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. Sometimes that's translated as inheritance, right? The Lord is my inheritance. And that's another thing that God is for us and that God can be for us and that God will be for us. Our inheritance, our inheritance especially in heaven. In heaven we will possess God as our delight. We will possess God as the object of our eternal joy. Loving God and being loved by God forever in an incredible ecstasy of joy and fulfillment. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. And Jesus, this happens especially in you. St. Paul makes it very explicit. Now, if we are children, in Romans 8, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share 
in his glory. We're heirs of God. That God is our inheritance. God is our reward. And co-heirs with Christ. If we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And to share in your sufferings, Lord, sounds negative, but it's really positive. To share in our Lord's sufferings is to share in his love. To love like he loved. Love one another as I have loved you. To the point of sacrifice. To the point of accepting suffering. And even more, even more, to share, Lord Jesus, in your sufferings is to share in your trust in the Father. To have such a great conviction. Such a great, solid belief in God's goodness, in God's trustworthiness. That we're willing to to suffer for God. We're willing to sacrifice for God. Co-heirs with Christ. In the Mass, Christ's merits are our own. So when we go to Mass, this is a great thing to really enjoy God. To be given Jesus in communion especially is kind of a foretaste of heaven. We enjoy him sacramentally on, on earth. He is our portion, our cup. We actually eat the body of Christ, which is not cannibalism because his body has become love. It's become an instrument of love. It's become something totally communicable, totally shareable because it's been divinized by the resurrection, made into a means, a channel, an expression of love, of communion. We eat his body. We drink his blood. And he becomes our satisfaction, even in a physical way. It's just a little foretaste, a little sample of how much we'll enjoy God in heaven. The Lord is our reward. He's our portion, our cup, our inheritance. Jesus, we want you to truly be all of this for us. I love you, O Lord, my strength, O Lord, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock of refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Praise be the Lord, I exclaim, and I am safe from my enemies. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock. Extolled be God, my Savior. God, my rock, God, my strength, God, my fortress, God, my deliverer. God, my righteousness, God, my salvation, God, my inheritance, God, my eternal joy, God, my portion, God, my bread, God, my God, God, my God, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. And so for God to be all of this for us, perhaps in the first place, we have to make sure that he's truly our God, that we're not closet idolaters, that we're not practical idolaters, that we don't have false gods before him. And this is the point that Jesus drives home for us in today's gospel. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. To say to the Lord that you are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you, nothing good apart from you. Is also to say that he has to be loved in this way. He has to be loved with this kind of radical exclusivity. He has to have that pole position in our heart. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment. And so if we don't love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, he's not going to be God for us. And if he's not fully God for us, well, then we shouldn't be surprised that he doesn't seem to be our rock and our refuge and our strength and our salvation. So the faith 
that God is all that for us brings with it this logical and natural condition or conclusion that we have to love him, that we have to love him above all things. We have to watch out for things that we love too much or in the wrong way. No matter how good and noble they be, they can't take God's place in our heart. We could say that there's only one throne in our heart. There's only one top spot in our heart. There's no one A and one B. There's one and then there's everything else. And so either God sits in that throne or other things sit in that throne. And unless God sits in that throne, well then we can't say to him, you are my God. Or we can say it and we can try to mean it, but it'll be kind of incomplete, right? It'll be a little bit false. There'll be a false tone or false note in that claim. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. You are my God. Which means we have to love him like this, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And how do we do that? Right? What, is, what does that look like? Well, we have to protect our time for God. We have to protect our times of prayer. Unless we explicitly adore God in our prayer, unless we explicitly give time and energy to God directly, right, to the things of God explicitly, well, it's going to be very hard for our hearts to maintain God in that pole position because we're creatures and because we're fallen. And so other concerns are going to overtake our concern for God and doing his will, loving him. Other desires are going to be inflamed and compete with our desire to love God and do his will and love others. Other ways of thinking, other ways of evaluating the goods of the world and life itself will impinge upon our faith, will kind of replace our supernatural outlook, our Christian view of things. And so every once in a while we have to look at that throne in our heart and see if there's any competitors kind of creeping up or trying to nudge out God. And we have to knock them off. It's like King of the Hill. I saw some boys playing King of the Hill on this rock the other day. And they're throwing each other off and trying to be the last one remaining alone on top of the hill. Well, that's a little bit like our spiritual life, right? It's like a game of King of the Hill. And God wants to be on top of the hill and we've got to make sure that we throw everything else off of that hill. Not that we don't love those things, not that they're, you know, they're going to fall off the hill and die or be destroyed, but we keep them from being God. We say, you are my God, you are my Lord, right? You are above all else in my life. And we protect that spot, I think, primarily by making sure we make time for prayer, time for putting our full attention in God and telling him that we love him. If we say to God with the psalmist, say to my soul, you are my salvation. In a way, God says to us, tell me you love me. God is saying this to each one of us. The only thing that God can ever lack is our love. The only thing we can withhold from him that he could, can't force or have just because he's God on our own is our free response to him, is our loving free response to him. The only thing that God could ever miss is our love. And so he says in Proverbs, my son, give me your heart. And he creates us free and gives us enough wiggle room not to love him. He gives us enough rope to wander. And yet he's always tugging in that rope saying, don't forget me. I created you. I love you. I care for you. I can be all of this for you. I can do all of this for you. I sent my son to suffer for you. Don't forget me. We say to God, say to my soul, you are my salvation. And God says to us, tell me that you love me. Make me God for you. Let me be God for you. This is from a hymn, a traditional hymn of the church, Verbum Supernum. From the moment of his birth, he gave himself to us as a friend. At the last supper, he gave himself as our food. 
By his death he gave himself as our ransom. In his kingdom he gives himself as our reward. God is my friend. God is my food. God is my ransom. God is my reward. The gift of God in Jesus Christ, the gift of God through Jesus Christ. From the moment of his birth, he gave himself to us as a friend. At the Last Supper, he gave himself as our food. By his death, he gave himself as our ransom. In his kingdom, he gives himself as our reward. Let's give ourselves back to God. Our Lady, our Mother, you did this. You are the mother of fair love, Mater Pulcre Delexionis, right? the mother of pure love, which means that she's the queen of all saints because she's the queen of love, the queen of charity. And so she'll teach us and she'll guide us by the hand and she'll remove obstacles, help us to let God be all that he can be for us and let us love God as he needs to be loved, truly as our one true God. Mater Pulcre Delexionis, Mother of Fair Love, pray for us. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect, my Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.